a warm welcome for day two. I hope you are not too tired uh, to get more information. We are moving forward into the 21st century now. Um, we have some reminiscence in between uh, as well, uh, but the focus is n the 21st century today. The first session is titled Pioneers of Science and Art. That means um, we will talk a bit about this uh, tension between these two directions and we want to bridge maybe to the new generation of artists living in, in social media and in blockchain and using a broad spectrum of tools uh, up to neural networks. That's our subject for today. And I'm very happy that Eric De Julie will start this morning. Eric um, is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at, at Toronto Mo Metropolitan University, and he's also well known, uh, a well-known digital artist. So he uh, combines in, in his life uh, both sides, uh, which we, we will address this morning. And on top, he's also working with continuity and continu continuity um, he is using uh, as his subject in science as well as in art, and that is a marvelous, yeah, reminiscence to Herbert. Um, he, 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 the, he, his eyes opened to aesthetics by realizing that there is, communi uh, there is continuity in nature, and continuity was a big subject for him in his first book, art and construction. So I thought it would be very interesting to bridge the, his ideas to the new time and to a modern physicist, what he has in mind, thinking about continuity, art and science. And Eric, it's a really great, great pleasure to have you here on stage. Please uh, come up and the mic is yours. And, you know, like yesterday, 20 minutes, 90 minutes, 19 minutes, okay. you know, so, okay, go ahead, we enjoy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Suzanne, it's really an honor and a privilege to, to be here. You know, I'm usually talking to physicists and uh, they can't be bothered even to put socks on, let alone a dinner jacket, so this is certainly the best dressed audience I've ever spoken for. So, I, I come to you, uh, as Susanna was saying, as both an artist and a physicist. I got started with art in the 90s as a teenager, but this is really not so much about me and actually a bit more retrospective, talking a bit about Herbert's work, uh, as Susanna mentioned. Okay, so, yes, this, this relationship between art and science, it's uh, quite complex, multifaceted, and indeed quite strained, so I'm going to talk about three different aspects of that relationship, and let me start by, uh, as Herbert was quite interested in, in using science actually to interrogate art. So I, I'll start with these images of Herbert's. I think maybe we saw one or two of them yesterday. And you can have in mind also other images that Herbert was making at the time. This is from the Dance of Electrons series. Then, and we can appreciate these images purely as aesthetic objects without any regard for, for how they were made. These are uh, generative photography experiments that were inspired by Herbert's work in physics he was doing before. But in fact, Herbert was interested in, in using the, the methods of science to interrogate art and to build a theory of, of perception and aesthetics. And this was as described, as Susanna was saying, in his first book that we also saw reference to yesterday. And looking back on this earlier time, um, more recently in an interview Herbert made before he passed, he, he said that this theory, which was eventually called cybernetic aesthetics, was for him a, a rational theory of art in which there was no place for the myth of the artist, and he wanted to base the analysis of art on exact science, uh, like physics in particular. And that meant approaching art neither philosophically nor historically, but rather clarifying what is common to all, all forms of art. And his conclusion with that was that what is common is that they're all opportunities for reception um, via the sensory organs of, of potential recipients. So with this perspective in mind, then let's look back at these images here, and you can have in mind also the other early images of, of Herbert we saw yesterday, also those of, uh, say, Ben Lepowski that he explicitly mentioned in the book, and others from that time, and, and take a different point of view, because for these 
For Herbert, these were not only aesthetic objects, but really experiments that he was taking. And Herbert asked the question, if we find these beautiful, then why? What is it that makes them so? And his conclusion for images like this was, was what he called continuity, that the, the lines and curves that you see here, they're, they're closed curves, and they're smooth curves. They have no kinks anywhere. Mathematically, we would say they're continuously differentiable, which Herbert just called continuity. And for him, this was something that, say, in, in generative photography like this, it's a direct consequence of the properties of the mathematical equations that govern the process that's being imaged. So say here, this is a bit abstract. These are images of electric fields. But um, say with images made from swinging pendula, then it's quite easy. The, the, the equations governing those phenomena are, are the simple ones you learn in first year physics. And the, the properties of those equations are indeed this continuity that Herbert was moving. So in Herbert's book, he discussed this as one of those principles that he thought could be used to, 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 to base a theory of, of aesthetics. It's not the only one, so to move on, let me show you this selection of forms here. This is not an image of Herbert's or anyone else's. I just made it for this talk. And looking at this image, one might say, well, there's something off about it. It doesn't look quite, quite right. And Herbert had the perception to say, OK, if I, say, if I ask what is wrong with this, uh, Her Herbert might say that it's out of balance. And then he, he was interrogating that, that thought, well, what do we mean when something is out of balance? Well, there's a very precise sense in which we know what balance means, and that's really in terms of fundamental physics. So he proposed this experiment to say, take the forms in some image, place them on, on, a, on a balance like this at the same horizontal position, and then one can ask the question, the physics question is, is this really balanced in the physical sense? And in this case, clearly it's not. It would tip to the right. And that's why, I mean, that's the out of balance in, in a mechanical sense that Herbert is, is saying that that's what we are applying aesthetically when we say something is out of balance aesthetically. So what is great is that Herbert didn't just take these as, as idle speculations that he was writing down, but he actually went and did the experiment. And that was really the key, key for me that really shows that this scientific outlet, out, outlook that he had inherited from his, his time doing physics, he was really applying that genuinely to, to artistic uh, phenomena. And so uh, from the text itself, this is what he was saying, that if, if one prepares lead weights in the precise shapes of the dark surfaces of a composition and then places them on the scale, the drawing will maintain its balance if it's supported in the center. And once you take this point of view, the scientific point of view, you, you do the experiments first on the simplest case, say with black and white forms. Maybe you want to restrict to say rectangular forms like I was showing before. And then if you can establish one general principle, and Herbert says, okay, well, uh, it doesn't work all the time, but more often than not, then the key is that once you have established one point, then you can move on to establish more, more comp complicated ones. So for example, once you have established what happens in the black and white case, then it's natural to ask, okay, what happens now if we add, if we add color? It doesn't immediately follow what's going to happen in that case. But again, Herbert did the experiment, and he said, okay, well, one should not take this as an irrefutable law. It's true more often than one would think, and it holds even if colored surfaces are involved. But in the case of color, one must adjust the thickness of the lead plate to the tonal value of the colors so that the darkest colors are covered with the thickest plates. And so you see that how... Sci Herbert's scientific point of view really pervades his approach to, to art, at least in this, in this first uh, book, and it seemed to be with him th throughout his life. And in, in fact, it's, it's also quite clear from the book, right from the introduction, that his scientific outlook was not um, restricted just to this investigations of art, but was really a more general phenomenon. And I would say that technological optimism really is, suffuses the, the whole uh, uh, book, Kunst und Konstruktion. And he says, uh, what is specific about our achievement technology is its sense of direction. That whereas the development of cultural phenomena usually proceeds in a manner similar to the maturing of a human being, going up and gradually down, in technology we have only progress. And he acknowledges that although this may, may sound arrogant that it's, it's actually true, that the unbroken progress of technology has everything to do with the remarkable characteristic of its foundation, that in the exact sciences, everything that has been once proved will remain true uh, forever. 
And so for this reason, new, new insights accumulate without destroying old ones. So as Buckminster Fuller said, every time we do a new experiment, we learn more. We cannot learn less. And although this was a time of, of uh, kind of widespread optimism in science, this point of view generally holds among scientists today, no matter where, where you, you encounter them. And as I said, although this was kind of the early Herbert, it seemed to be still present 70 years later. So in an interview that he performed in 2022, he, he said something similar. So Frank says, ultimately the point is not to leave new technologies which are value neutral to begin with, to technocrats, commerce, and so on. Art is also part of our society and it should deal with the tools of today's society. And the interviewer actually pushed back and said, why do you say that te technologies are value neutral? Today there is so much to that suggests otherwise. And Herbert replied right away, not because of technology, it's humans that abuse it. And again, uh, Herbert's point of view is really the, the common scientific one that I share myself. Although, at, at least in the English-speaking countries, I would say that the, the point of view of the interviewer is now actually the mainstream one. So, so much so, for example, that, that algorithm as a word probably was more or less unknown 20 years ago, but now it's almost a dirty word in the English-speaking countries. And that's really quite a remarkable, remarkable shift. So this leads me now to the idea of the two cultures. So some of you may have noticed in the, the logo for the foundation that when it's shown in its complete form here, you may notice something. That on the left there's an equation, S equals K log, log W, which is Boltzmann's formula. Ludwig Boltzmann was a famous physicist, one of the fathers of statistical physics in the early uh, 19th century, or end of, sorry, end of the 19th century, early 20th century. And in fact, it's engraved on his, bolt, on his uh, tombstone, as you can see on the right there. And Boltzmann's formula, I, I won't explain the full thing. If you want the explanation, you can ask me, well, you can take my thermal phys physics class, and if you don't want that, I can, you can ask me later. But it really underlies the second law of thermodynamics, which is the law that prevents the construction of perpetual motion machines, and is very, very important for, for many reasons um, that you can ask me about later. And what I like about this is that this is actually the same phenomenon that was mentioned in the context of the two cultures. So this was a lecture given by C.P. Snow. He was trained as a physicist, but then worked mostly as a writer and journalist. And he commented, again, at the same time that Herbert was working originally, that many times he had been present at gatherings of the intelligentsia for people that are, by the traditional standards, thought to be highly educated and sometimes are expressing their uh, incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. And sometimes he, he had been provoked and asked them, well, how many of you could describe the second law of thermodynamics? And the response was very cold. And yet he was asking something which is about the scientific equivalent of, have you read a work of Shakespeare's? So I like that there is th this, this connection. I mean, Suzanne told me that the, the connection to, to, to Boltzmann's formula was a personal connection that, that Herbert had with, with um, Boltzmann's fami family. But I like this connection to the, the two cultures, which we'll get back to in the, in the panel. So th that was about using science to interrogate art. That was one of Herbert's interests. And now let me, let me reverse the direction of, of logic here. And instead, let's see if we can use art to illustrate science. And here, we'll actually discuss this in the context of one of my own pieces. So if you concentrate on this little image fragment in the center of the screen, and if I ask you, well, what, what do you see there? What kind of 3D shape could that be a part of? Then one can imagine that maybe we have some glass plates, but from what you see there, you couldn't really tell the orientation of the plates. It's not clear. There's ambiguity in the forms. And now, if I reveal a bit more and let your eyes move up and to the right, then you see that, well, if those are glass plates, they have to be arranged in a horizontal manner. But now, if I, if I reveal even more, if you try to, to piece together what you are learning about the 3D forms, you will see that you can't actually piece together something that's globally satisfied, something that makes sense everywhere. If you, some places you'll start, that ambiguity will collapse as you reach, reach an edge one way, but you cannot globally construct a consistent picture. It's only when you zoom out and don't see any microscopic details at all that you start to see some unified whole. And this, in fact, is exactly the situation that we have in quantum mechanics, which is the theory, the basic fundamental theory of the world. And so what I call this is actually the visual interpretation of quantum mechanics. So indeed, 
If you have, say, a spin of an electron, then the spin could be pointing up or it could be pointing down, and there's fundamental uncertainty in the world. That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And it's only when we do the experiment that the, those possibilities collapse, the so-called collapse of the wave function, and you get, measure one of those results. But there's no way to construct a global picture that satisfies everywhere. The classical world that we see is only really something that's a fiction that we, we see when we, we zoom out. It's not actually fundamentally there at the microscopic level. And so one often hears that quantum mechanics is something that cannot be explained, you can't understand it, we only understand it mathematically, and that this, I think, is some, uh, maybe not proof, but at least suggestion to the contrary. So this is part of a series, uh, Glass, that I released on Artblocks in 2022, that we'll, he we'll hear more about Artblocks uh, later in the day. So, uh, quantum mechanics, of course, uh, pr was primarily developed, in fact, in Germany. The first person who really understood the drastic departure that it, that it really necessitated from our classical picture of the world was Werner Heisenberg. And so I, I'll spare you my, my attempt at pronouncing the German. In, in English, he said the trajectory that only comes into existence by us observing it. And this is really not, it's not a metaphor, it's, it's really true. The, the classical world where we, we imagine a objective reality shared by everyone is actually false. We know that it's false. It's only a fiction that is, um, that is apparent because we're macroscopic objects consisting of a very huge number of degrees of freedom. When we look very closely at the microscopic world, in fact, quantum mechanics tells us there's fundamental uncertainty. Okay, and I, I think that the, the art piece that I showed you at least can give you some honest suggestion of what that uncertainty really, really means and what that, that tension is between the microscopic world and the macroscopic world. Okay, so that, that was about using art to illustrate scientific concepts where, from the scientific point of view, they're, they're well understood. But we can actually go further and ask, well, can we actually use art to advance science beyond what is actually known? And th this, again, was an interest of Herbert, so he said, my idea of art was, and still is, to venture into unknown new territory. And this was one of the ideas underlying his math art series from works from the 80s to the 90s, where at the time when um, computers were sufficiently primitive that, okay, one could construct images of mathematical functions, and you could, try to, you could visualize things that otherwise by pencil and paper couldn't be visualized. So as an example, I, I picked one of my favorites from the series on the right here. This is a visualization of some mathematical function. It's kind of easy to write down, but just from the formula, it's very hard to see what it would look like. But on the computer, one can use that and really gain some intuition about what, what is this uh, mathematical function. And I, I liked uh, the discussion that Herbert had in a paper, this is from 1985, where he went into a bit more detail. So in, in the paper, he discusses how Descartes, a long time ago, had introduced the analytical methods into geometry. And then from, from then on, analytical methods took over as the, the way to do math, rigorous mathematics. And Herbert posed the question, well, can we actually go beyond that and, and do something where we would like, say, visual methods to really take prominence again, as they had in the early days when the Greeks were doing uh, geometry uh, a la Euclid. And so Herbert said the, the formula is, is well adapted to, to representing mathematical relationships, but it expresses them very abstractly. Whereas with the picture, one gains the highest clarity, but one accepts the renunciation of, of general validity. So to illustrate what I think Herbert was trying to get at, let me give you the example of uh, the Jordan curve theorem. So this is a theorem It says, okay, let's consider a closed planar curve with no self-intersection. So planar just means it exists in two-dimensional plane. Closed means it has no open ends, and there's no self-intersections. That's um, quite clear. Then the, what the, the the state, what the theorem states is that the curve separates the plane into two regions, the interior and the exterior. So as an example, here's the kind of blob here. The boundary of the blob would be the curve, and the result of the theorem is that you can color the blob like this, you can color the inside black and the outside will remain white. And although that's a statement that might seem completely obvious, in fact, the, all the conventional proofs are, are extremely difficult. And the mathematicians are very smart, it's not for any lack of ingenuity, it's generally something that's very hard to prove. And I think what Herbert is asking is, that, is there some kind of visual calculus that would make this elementary and that would allow us, as we do in other parts of mathematics, to build up our knowledge from simple things to more complicated things? And so uh, let me leave that as an exercise to the audience here, and let me thank you for your attention.